Okay, uh, thank you everyone so much for tuning in to my virtual plant walk. I obviously have so much to say about plants that I decided that I'm just gonna do like individual videos because um, each, the plant walk ended up being like almost an hour. So I just decided to do individual videos. And um, first off, I wanna take a moment to uh, pay tribute to the land that we're on. And since I live in Seattle, I'm on the land of the Duwamish tribe within the Coast Salish territory. Um, so this first plant that we're gonna talk about today is Indian plum or Oso berry. And it's this one right here with the little elongated flowers. Um, there's a couple snow berries and thimble berries like in the way, but um, in the back you can see it's kind of like one plant, like a kind of a bigger shrub. Um, so first off, I want to touch on the fact of the name, right? Oso berry or Indian plum? That's kind of confusing. So traditionally it's always been, I mean, not always, the Coast Salish had a name for it as well, uh, which I unfortunately don't know. And if, if anybody has the name for that, I would love to find out. Um, but um, traditionally it's always been called Oso Berry as the common name. And somewhere along the lines, as it spread out between um, the uh, Cascadia, you know, California, Oregon, Washington coast, and um, up into Canada, it somehow got the name Indian Plum, and I finally recently had the opportunity to ask somebody in the Muckleshoot tribe if that name is technically considered culturally inappropriate. And basically, um, they didn't really have an, a straightforward answer. What I got from it was that we should just start transitioning into calling it Oso Berry, because that's its traditional um, common name. Um, so this plant is surprisingly a member of the Rose family. And so the rose family, as you can imagine, is a huge family and it has, you know, apples and all of our fruits and berries. So there's a lot of subfamilies within the family itself. So um, Oso Berry is within the almond uh, subfamily and that basically has to do with what the seed looks like. And um, so the first story I want to tell you about this plant is the cultural significance of this plant. I mean, this really, this plant has so much cultural significance, but First off, um, in our modern day of society, we, for some reason, like rely on the uh, groundhog to tell us if we're gonna have an early or late spring. Well, the Coast Salish people would use this plant to indicate whether we are going to have an early or late spring, simply due to the blooming of the flowers. If we are going to have an early spring, which we did this year, it would bloom in February, at the beginning of February. But if we're gonna have a late spring, then it would bloom at the end of March. But if we're gonna have your typical spring arrives on the first day of spring, then it'll arrive on the first day of spring. Or actually, uh, first day of spring is like March 20th, I think. So it'll arrive like at the end of February, so. Um, and then I kinda wanna go into uh, the botany of it. So I'll pick this little flower. And so you can see here how the flowers are um, white and they are um, a cluster, an elongated cluster, like reaching downwards towards Mother Earth. So beautiful. I'm so closer up here. Um, as you can see, this plant's kind of like transitioning into its life. And so the petals are falling off, but um, so traditionally it'll have five petals and five sepals. Um, which is a family indicator of the rose family. And so here you see we're having pollen. So we have the stamens and we'll like crack that open, see if it has a female reproductive. And so it doesn't, all it does, all this uh, cone-like receptacle has is pollen in it. And so we know that this plant will produce fruit. And since we know this plant will produce fruit, we know that this plant is monoecious, which means that this plant houses both female and male parts just on different flowers. So the one I showed you in my hand is the uh, male flower. And so what that basically means for pollinators is the pollinators get the opportunity to grab pollen from one flower and transition to another flower. So taking the pollen from the male flower and dropping it within the female flower, um, impregnating the seed, which will then result in a droop or plum as we know it. So um, I'm gonna give you a minute to think about what kind of pollinator could pollinate this. 
So the clues are they're white flowers. And the second clue is um, it needs something to be able to reach up in here. So I wanna be able to decolonize the classroom even though we're in virtual cyberspace classroom. So I'm gonna give you like a couple minutes. We'll just like dance it off a little bit, dance in the rain. Dee, 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 dee. <laughs> so the pollinator is, drum roll, doo, 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 doo. it is a moth. And so we know that because, and I don't know the specific moth, although I wish I did. Um, we know it's a moth because it needs, since it has a cone like receptacle, it obviously needs a pollinator to be able to like reach up inside, um, inside of there. So you might think like hummingbird or a butterfly, but since it's a white flower, that indicates that it's pollinated at night because the night pollinators such as moths and bats rely on the white flower to act as a moon reflecting or uh, the white flower to act as a mirror reflecting the moon which guides their way to um, to the flower so they can pollinate it and be provided with food so thank you moss for all that you do um, so let's see um, next up is talking about the um, the soon to be droops um, so basically once the seed becomes impregnated it will form into this beautiful yellow droop which will then fade into a deep orange will which will then fade into an even deeper purple and that deep purple sig signifies the presence of a high amount of anthocyanins and so anthocyanins does anybody know what those are it's a subcategory within um, and uh, antioxidants and so antioxidants are super important for our body because they like are scavengers in our body and they're looking for toxins and pol uh, pollution and chemicals from our food and so we can only get those from plants right and so natural wild plants have more than like your regular farmed and then even more than your um, you know GMO plants um, so we're very lucky so um, our yeah, so if you have more questions on that, I'm happy to answer them. I love talking about antioxidants and plants that have them and don't or have less. And yeah, so we can talk more about that. Um, next up, I want to talk about the leaves because the first thing I ever learned about this plant, somebody just was like, eat this leaf. And I was like, what? Excuse me? And so I did. And it just has like the most amazing cooling cucumber flavor that I've ever experienced. And so I highly suggest if you go on one of your walks, one of our government allotted walks, um, please find this plant and please take the opportunity to taste a leaf. And you know, I don't always suggest, you know, just tasting a leaf, um, but um, you know, through this video, I hope that you're able to identify it properly like in the wild. So um, because of this leaf and its amazing flavor, I am currently in the process of making my first ever wild yeast fermentation from the leaves. And so I'm hoping like once that's done, it still keeps its like cucumber bitter S flavor, um, which I will then once the salmon berries like come into life, I will then make a salmon berry and um, wild yeast fermented um, Oso berry uh, soda, which I'm super excited for. Cause you know, when you're fermenting, it takes forever. And so when you finally get that final product, it's like this fulfilling, feeling that you get that you don't get from anything else um and the last thing I want to touch on is like please go out and try these berries once they're ready like taste what nature has to offer us however like don't harvest too much because it's really important that you understand that these seasons for berries and plums and things like that are really short and the birds and the deer really rely on their market to be able to like get nutrients and so I always like to remind people that you know we don't want to take too much from nature we want them to thrive in addition so thank you everyone so much for tuning in and please if you have any questions just uh, send me a message or a comment on this video have a great rest of your day bye